Hello. To change tack a little bit, uh, I am here to talk about my small project, which maybe has the scope of the single feature of these other projects that we've just uh, heard about. Uh, my name is Casper Emanuel. Uh, I'm an electronic design engineer and a uh, software developer. Uh, uh, I use these languages listed there. Uh, I do PCB layout using KiCad. Uh, I'm often on the KiCad mailing list in IRC. Um, and uh, I work as a freelance consultant. Uh, but I'm here to talk about uh, a little tool that I made to kind of scratch my own itch. Uh, in and it's a browser extension to quickly add components to retailer shopping carts because that is something that's very boring and tedious and uh, that's why I made this. <laughs> uh, I only have a very limited amount of time, so I'm quickly going to cover what it does, how it does it, and what it might do in the future <laughs> if I manage to find some time to develop it further, or if someone else would like to contribute something. Uh, so what does it do? <laughs> Oop, I've skipped the video, which shows you what it does. So the idea is that you... Oh, the idea is that you have your filler materials in a particular format. Uh, the order is you have your line notes, which really can be anything, but it's useful to have schematic references in there. And you have your quantity, and then you name a retailer that you want to purchase from, and you put your retailer part number in third, uh, fourth, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, fourth. <laughs> and uh, you can then, if you, uh, you can then copy and Moving over to the browser, you can open the extension and just paste that data into there. And you then get a nice overview of what you're trying to uh, purchase. Uh, you can quickly open the cart tabs. And even you know within the ones you've opened, you can select them. If you've got parts in there already, you can easily clear them because you might not want that those particular things for that project. So, uh, and but the main feature is that you then quickly add these components to shopping carts, and you get all your references in there. That means when you get your components, uh, uh, you basically have almost it in a in a kit format that you can then use to assemble. Um, so obviously, retailers already have these uh, kind of tools available. Uh, individual retailers do kind of quick paste kind of things, but the advantage of this is that it unifies the format. It doesn't matter which re retailer you're going to use, you, you it's always the same format. And it just generally, generally streamlines the process of managing your car and emptying it. For some of the retailers, it takes a surprising amount of clicks to actually empty your car and things like that. They do <laughs> some annoying things like that, which you don't really want to deal with. And uh, one important thing for me when designing it was that it always gave a you really clear feedback on what uh, went wrong, if something went wrong. So I use these notifications there that give you errors or warnings, uh, depending on how severe I think uh, the situation might be. Um, one neat little feature that I added was that if you've got a tab se separate values online, uh, then you can quickly, this kind of blue badge and button appears there and you can quickly add those components directly from a website. Uh, so it kind of enables really quick sharing of uh, building materials as well. Uh, so the features currently are, it's a Chrome extension. Uh, I'm currently working on a Firefox port. Uh, it supports these retailers listed there uh, in over 100 locations. So you set what country you're in, and it, it chooses the right uh, retailer website depending on that. I've used the CPAL license, which is maybe a little controversial, but it's a free software endorsed license, free software foundation endorsed license, and also I approve. So I, I'm, I'm the sole contributor anyway, so if you've got a problem with the license, I'm probably willing to relicense it. Um, 
so let's cover how this works. Uh, it, like I previously mentioned, it passes tab separated values, which is the clipboard format of most ex uh, most um, spreadsheet formats, uh, spreadsheet programs. Um, it's kind of a an easy format to pass because nobody really wants tabs in their actual data, so it's a nice delimiter and fairly trivial to pass. Uh, what it really does is mimic the HTTP requests that the reseller sites themselves cause your browser to send, uh, and then quickly passing the HTML responses and using uh, quick and dirty indicators to determine whether what uh, you wanted to happen happened. Just a quick note on how HTTP works in case there's people who don't have never really done anything with that. Uh, it's either a GET or POST request, or there's some other more obscure ones which are uh, used less often, or at least not in my situation. Uh, the parameters that you want to uh, pass to your site are, are sent along with a request, and it returns a status, which some of you, you should have seen a 404 status or a 402 status. Uh, um, sorry, is that time left? Or ti oh. <laughs> uh, the return status and, uh, and the response, usually HTML and uh, cookies are used to persist data uh, during, the se during the session. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the, in the browser tools uh, debugging HTTP requests and having a look at what these sites actually send when you add components. And it's not a very clean API. This is what you'd have to do, type on the command line if you want to add a component, if you want to add this pre-ink component to the Mauser website. Um, this actually, I've, I've truncated this here, this goes on for 20,000 <laughs> uh, characters, which is the view state of the web application. I have no idea what that's for, but I have to retrieve it and I have to send it in order for my request to be accepted. Uh, so the architecture, is, it, it's written in CoffeeScript. It's a little language that can pass to JavaScript because JavaScript is the only thing that will run in browsers. Uh, it's an object-oriented design. It has a, has a barrage of automated functional tasks uh, and a simple GUI. Um, so I've already covered CoffeeScript. It's a small language that can uh, compiles to JavaScript. It has a nice kind of Python-esque syntax and uh, very kind of clear and to us, uh, you see that's a function application, the add component is actually a function application that's just generative. Thanks for that. Um, that makes it a nice little list comprehension. There's a lot of good things about CoffeeScript. I think what I, the reason I chose it at the time is that I hadn't written JavaScript in a long time and it kind of guides you along to write some good JavaScript. But it's very close to the JavaScript itself. Uh, and another good, re another reason was that uh, it has classes and I wanted to do an object oriented design. So uh, that was another reason. Uh, you might not want to choose it because you know it's another level of abstraction. You, you have your other compilation step and uh, you need to choose source maps and other things. Um, so the object-oriented design, the main thing is I have a retail interface, which is extended by each of the individual uh, retailer uh, objects or classes. <laughs> um, they the main the main methods you can see here using using method declarations, uh, you know you can use refresh the cards, uh, refresh the site, and the main operations are then uh, implemented in each individual class uh, of adding the items and clearing the cards, which are really very dependent on what site it is. Uh, so this abstraction works really well in some ways. Uh, for instance, uh, Funnel switched over to using a uh, new arc style site. Um, so they, re they were reusing what they had implemented for Nuark in their Funnel sites over here. And I noticed this came up in my test. It wasn't working anymore. And all I simply had to do was detect that this was happening and replace all my methods with the one I'd already implemented from Nuark. So that was <laughs> I was very happy about that. Um, in, in other ways, I don't really like the abstraction because often uh, often I'm using there's no there's this the concept of instantiating different objects um, isn't, doesn't always make sense. For instance, I have this bomb manager class and I can create a new bomb manager, but really there is only one bomb manager. And uh, the bomb manager kind of 
has all the retail interfaces and takes care of doing uh, bigger operations on all of them, uh, and maybe it wouldn't be, uh, it's, n it's not, so I don't really need a second one, so I don't know why I need to instantiate it. And similar thing goes for having different country uh, instantiations of this digi-key object, for instance. Uh, really, there's only, you're ever only in one country, so I don't know. It shouldn't really be mutually possible that I need, I can do that. Uh, so that's where the abstraction falls down for me a bit. Uh, so the automated functional tests, I used a framework called QUnit, and it kind of gives me this nice little overview of the uh, tests that are passing and failing, and would do a diff if something fails. Uh, I didn't, I couldn't really do a lot of unit tests that you see here with the unit testing that I managed to do, because basically the, the, uh, the tests are heavily dependent on the network, and I did, there's, obviously those are the unit tests there, but then there's a much larger amount of tests which actually go to site and uh, test for each individual, for each country, test the responses and sees that this, this kind of interaction is working correctly, but uh, I run into problems because, you know, the network requests can time out or I get forbidden uh, to <laughs> access the site for that moment because I'm sending too many requests, uh, which is something which really only really happens in the test situations and not in uh, uh, actual use of the plugin of the extension. It has a very simple GUI, just um, kind of, as you saw initially in the video, if you've got no data, there's only one button to press really, and uh, afterwards you have these operations, these these uh, five operations that you can do, and that's, that's really it. Um, I didn't use any UI libraries for this, and I found that JavaScript at the moment is enough to, to uh, for um, manipulating the, um, the document object model, and uh, I use as many Chrome features as possible to kind of ease the development of this little badge there. I didn't have to re-implement the icon to get that badge to appear. That's, you know, a specific Chrome feature. Um, so what might I do in the future? Right, right now, it's Chrome only, and uh, there's about 200 weekly users. That's the statistics I get from the Chrome web store, which means 200 users that start their browser in the last week with the plugin enabled. <laughs> so kind of really specific statistic there. Um, so the upcoming features of Firefox support, I don't think it's really that important to m current users that because it's the kind of tool that you, you when you need it, you, you might just install it. You could open Chrome for one for that bit and just pur do your purchase and then close it again. It's not necessarily, w uh, you don't necessarily need Firefox support, but I want to get it in now so that as I develop it, I can develop for both platforms simultaneously. Uh, Allowing, so the big fe the features that I'm excited about, I have a whole roadmap online on the website, but the features I'm excited about are uh, allowing multiple retailers per item. The format is kind of allows for that because the retail and the cart number are the last thing, so you could just keep repeating that for different retailers and then you could make um, bigger bills, ma bills of materials that cover off all possible retailers. And this, this thing would then really allow for people to publish their bill of materials online and then al allow users to quickly just click on the, an icon on there and uh, order those components. And then, you know, if you combine that with the, with the Gerber, uh, uh, if you combine that with the Gerber online that you can send to a low cost PCB manufacturer, you essentially have a kit with all the references labeled uh, at your doorstep. Um, then for even further on, I'm, I wanna kind of find the same components from different retailers you can just input your thing, your the ones you are purchasing, and then hopefully the tool can figure out what what that might mean for other retailers, so that you can generate larger bombs that other people can use for their preferred retailers. And maybe my 1.0 goal really is to have a function to minimize the cost of your bill of material, and kind of figuring out what um, what the lowest cost plus shipping would be, uh, and save everyone money. <laughs> And that's it. I did not. No, I did. Oh, 
the question was uh, whether I contacted any of the suppliers to see if they would, you know, expose a sensible API. And I did not. I don't think I would have got much of a response, uh, not in the time that I wanted to implement this anyway. Uh, I did contact Farnell for a while because I, I noticed they were switching over their sites and they gave me some information as to when they were doing that, although it wasn't very good, but it was some information. <laughs> There's, I don't have, the, the tool doesn't have any database. It just, or I guess you mean the, the oh sorry, I will repeat the question. Uh, the question was whether uh, the tool would, what would happen essentially if you try and add a component that's not in currently in stock? Yes, uh, so um, in that case, uh, it will give you uh, an, uh, uh, it, it, it depends a little bit on the site, but, uh, it will give you an error in the sites where it can't do anything about it. On DigiKey, there's it just uh, it's it goes through and there's a suggestion by the site for f an alternative component, uh, and that is kind of automatically added. <laughs> and th those I've looked at those suggestions there and normally just because they've changed their their internal number, so it is the same component. <laughs> 